So for the recording purposes, <laughs> this is our March 18th uh, winter lecture series and our first speaker will be Bob Easterly on the inner space race. Let me share Bob's presentation. How many people do we have remote? We have 14 people remote. <laughs> Let's show it this way. I want to show it different way. Always a fun time, right? Work, of course, <laughs> if you have to try to work these things out. <laughs> I was loading Marty's up. Uh, oh, you just had some viewers out of the mercy. Yeah. There we go. All right. Sorry for the inconvenience here. Now I just need to share that. Push space bar to advance or mouse click. Yeah. All right. You guys see the presentation? Pull folks online. And uh, change. <laughs> Over here, Bob. There's a page up and down. Okay, and that's and that's what I do to advance. It's page down. Okay, just one there. Keep going. All right, I'll turn you over to Bob Easterly. Hi, folks. Um, I really was excited about presenting this. This uh, particular presentation, I had planned on giving this uh, back in February or March of 2020, and um, I had it. As a piece, and of course, I've enhanced it a lot over the last couple of years. But the reason why February 2020 is this is this whole time period was coming through with you remember, we had the 50th anniversary of the landing on the moon, and all these events coming forward was meeting with NASA, was at the museum with the spy satellite, all these things were coming across. And finally, I talked to Mark and I said, Mark, believe me, this thing coming up in front of us, I think I better do a short talk. How's that? And Mark goes, Oh, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. So I did a presentation on coronavirus early that first first day of March, and and all these questions came up. And I said, okay, after that we had no more meetings live, yeah. you know, mask and everything. So I'm cycling this all the way back around and and bringing this through. So put your minds, but is this 50 years after the uh, successful landing on the moon and so on? And what I'm trying to inform you here is not only was there an outer space race but I'm gonna tell you about an inner space race. There was a lot of scientific endeavors that were going on. And uh, you'll see why the name is called what it is. That's uh, page, page down. Page down. Hang on one second. Going all the way on the right side of the top. Yep, there we go. Okay, so any credits I'll give you to the end instead of talking through those pieces. Okay, so let me just give you an overview of what we're gonna talk about. Well. It cycles all the way back to what's happening now. We have a brief conflicts. We'll talk about the conflicts between the United States and the Soviet Union and how this kicked off in those, in those right after World War II. We're going to learn about this expansion of knowledge about outer space and inner space. And I'm not talking about particle physics. Um, and we're talking about how Hollywood, if you remember this time in the 50s, early 60s, how Hollywood dealt with all these movies about going into outer space and about, you know, journey to the center of the earth. So there's a lot of that things happening. 
And then we'll talk about digging deep into the earth to find this particular area, this boundary. And we're going to learn about some urban legends and hoaxes that occurred. Uh, of course, there's one. <laughs> and we'll talk about the future. Okay. So let's look at what happened here is after World War II, a series of events occurred. First of all, you remember what happened after the war? We helped the Soviets, we cleared, you know, the Nazis were defeated. And through an arrangement, Patton wanted to go into Russia and be able to help re rebuild, just like we did with Japan and other countries. They didn't. That was a big mistake. And what happened was, is the, the managers at the time said, you know, the president and managers at the time said, listen, is there a problem? Nope. Okay, okay. okay great. Thank you. Uh, what they said was, no, we're going to go, go ahead. The, the Soviets want to be able to take part of this. So we divided up Germany. And everybody's going to help manage this safely. Remember, before, Russia was working together. Well, all of a sudden, they took over Poland, Ukraine. All these areas were, were taking over that property. And what happened? Well, Stalin, you know the story with Stalin, with all the things that he did. Okay, he puts up the Berlin Wall, Iron Curtain, right? And then they come over in 1949. This is right after the war. They, their spies came in, stole the atomic bomb, and detonated the atomic bomb, right? So we're getting tense. What's going on with this regime? Okay, so now everybody's worried about the atomic bomb. And all of a sudden, they had the Soviet had the hydrogen bomb. So suddenly, they do ICBMs and also long-range bombers. They're going to be able to deliver that weapon to us. Okay, so what did we do? And this gets you into the preface to what we're talking about. So the United States gets together by 55, President Eisenhower. This is before the UN. He decides to meet together in Geneva. And in Geneva, like they said, listen, we don't want to have a war with it. We don't want to fight this again. We don't want to have World War III. Let's go in and let's have an agreement. Let's just monitor what you're doing over in your country. And they didn't. They said, the Soviets said, screw you. <laughs> We're not going to allow you into the country. And so we started doing all these programs to try to get over there to try to figure out what they're doing. I mean, how many missiles do we aim against them? You know, it was affected our spending. So we started doing all kinds of things. We launched 600 balloons and only a few dozen got back. And the government opened up to all types of investments in science. And again, right, the moonshot, all the missiles, everything we did led to this. Okay, remember the U-2 getting shot down? So the big thing is everything changed. 1955, 56, and they're getting approval, doing all these science projects, not really talking about going to the moon. And all of a sudden, they send up Sputnik. And Sputnik took a big impact in the Rochester area. People tracking Sputnik. Remember, we had talks about this. Where is this going? What are they going to do? If they can put a payload like Sputnik up in space, weighing 185 pounds, if they can get a ball using their ICBM missiles, they can drop a bomb to us anywhere in the Earth. So what did we do? Well. Remember, this is the, you know, if they can do that, remember the duck and cover? Remember that they started installing air raid sirens. And all these things came out, you know, building bomb shelters, massive expenditures all around the country to the threat from the Soviets, which they're still there today, right? Okay. The military was doing all the development prior. So what was happening now is they moved it over and set up, look, we need to have, just like they did with the shuttle, we need to go from the military building these things we need to go and get all these separate companies, McDonnell Douglas, all these companies to build the rockets, to build the equipment. We need to have everybody jump on this. So that's where NASA was created. Okay, and of course, later you remember the story about President Kennedy making the announcement. Okay, so this spread everywhere. A big excitement, Congress, senators, everybody spending money toward education and people going into engineering. School kids practicing, how are we gonna live on these planets? What are we gonna do? The travel. Okay. And of course, Hollywood had their role. <laughs> the role. Okay. So, how did they deal with it? Do you remember, you remember watching some of these movies? Okay. So, I remember this one was remember, they had all the space pictures, Rocket Man and everything else, but they also had pictures on the ground. You remember the Superman episode where there was a hole and these green dwarfs come out of the hole? 
and they actually made a long-term movie and they got into the town. The town was afraid they were going to shoot and kill them. And, and Superman saved them, got them to go back down in the hole. So that's, so then all of a sudden you get into some other people, they're trying to increase your knowledge. So here's Edmund Haley, now Haley's comment. Back in 1692, he says, the earth is hollow. There's nothing down there. And his calculation was Isaac Newton just had just published a couple of years earlier, the Principia book three. In the book, he had a series of wrong formulas that were, that were incorrect. And what he did is he used his formulas and calculated the earth being four ninths of it is hollow, a massive hollow ball with just a shell. Okay, so that led to, wait a second, if this is hollow. We've got people living down there, we've got subterranean. Oh, by the way, did you see Mars? There's canals, all this hysterica and everything going on. Okay, so then we get the space race. So now let's look at what we really know about, what do we know about going into space? Well, none of everybody's, we're cramming for that. Remember, we're sending people up in these short trips. What do we know about down on the earth? Because remember, the, the Soviets wanted to do the same thing. So Lord Kelvin said, look, all the way, well, he said this whole earth is solid. He disagrees with that. And he said the earth is solid. And we have this thin layer of magma. And that when it gets pressure, it pushes the volcano, you know, up to the volcanoes. And that just wasn't true. Finally, there was a group of geologists and called mobilists that said, look, everything's moving around. There's plates and drift. And there was a big argument going on because some people call fixists said, oh, no, there's not plates. It's just a solid crust. What are you talking about? They won out and had the theory that there's continental drift. And finally, a key person in 1909, Andrea, it's hard to spell, a Croatian said, listen, he sat there and had these detail maps and he was tracking seismic activity. And when it went in, he was trying to figure out why it's going through different speeds. He, you know, he was really outlining the science. So if I can explain, here, I'll bring up a couple pieces. There you go. So what happened here is he calculated that if an event occurs, if it goes strictly through the crust, it may travel at six kilometers. If it goes all the way down through this barrier, this moho, and into the mantle and comes back out, it shows up minutes earlier, much, much earlier than it does if it follows the crust, much shorter path. What is causing this? What? It doesn't make sense. What's, why is this occurring? Okay, so let's get a little brief description if you're not to cover some of these things. So what's seismic activity? So seismic waves, there are several types. There's a P wave. And when, it, when an event first happens, there's that initial shock. And that travels the fastest. Okay, that goes through everything. Rock, mountains, lava, water. And then there's the secondary waves, and that's the one you see the pictures of. The secondary waves is all of a sudden it hits, and there's this right angle, the shearing up and down, the movement, destroying buildings. Okay, that cannot travel through liquid. So they use that information when they look at the waves, so they know that the P waves are making it through, but the S are not, so they know there's liquid core. And there's a call the surface wave travels along. Okay. So this helps them map the detailed readings. They can actually see the different boundaries in the earth and see what's liquid and what's solid from all their signals. That's how they're figuring it out today. I mean, they've not drilled a hole to the crust, to the crust right, all the way. Okay, so this leaves all these questions. Why did they move faster through the mantle? What are, what are, how are we gonna dig a hole? How are we gonna do this to figure this out? What is the material? And you remember, <clears throat> A volcano, say, erupts and brings up some of these large stones. They break them open, and they came from the mantle, and they're filled with diamonds, certain types of stones, right? So they know a lot of these elements that we have in the earth are all from way down into the mantle and below, and are being brought up by volcanoes. So they're saying, my goodness, all the things we're going to find. So here's an example of one of the holes here. And you remember, just like when you're looking at a telescope out in space, you're saying that was so many million years ago or a billion years ago. The same thing when you dig a hole. 
as you go down, you're looking to see what, what is down in those depths. Okay, so there's some other mysteries. Hold on. <laughs> okay, so there's a lot of things happening at the Earth. Let's, let's try to do the, the whistle on there. So I think it was the first one. I just need to do a new share. So. Yeah. And if we can't find it, that's okay. Right? What we can do is uh... what's happening while he's doing this is I've got several YouTube videos where it shows all these anomalies occurring. Um, not shown in the example is like every 26 seconds, there's a pulse that shakes the earth. They don't know why. In this video, can you get the sound up? Do you guys hear it online? You might be hear it online, but you may not hear it. I can hear it. I can hear it. Okay. The Earth has a whole series of whistles that are emanating from the surface going out in space. And our satellites pick up this. You think it's quiet out there? <laughs> it's really noisy. Okay. If you share an optimized video, that'll allow you to do that. So that's how we share. Okay. Want to do it again? You want to keep going? It, we, it's up to you. Go ahead, go ahead to the next one. You want to just, you want to just share another different one? Yeah, this these are both dramatic from the. That's why I picked them for you. I'll have them if people need to get these links. You know. Did you want this one too? Oh uh, sure. Let's do this one. You hear any audio from this? Or no? You're going to hear this massive rumble as some of these recordings have occurred down in the earth. So what part of the videos that I had here, I'll just give you a quick description. Um, people from around there, they think it's, you know, they're thinking tennis and they're actually reporting this low grade hum and vibration. And they got vibration maps where it's come, being picked up through the rock densities and stuff around the earth. And it's actually coming from the earth. And there's a series of them where they're, they're trying to track these. They don't know why some areas are much louder than others. A lot of people may not hear them. But the recording instruments are showing these large vibrations. Okay. No, it's okay. What? If you unshare and reshare optimize the video, uh, it's they're hearing it online where we can't hear here because of the they, the they can hear it online? Yes, they're great. Oh, yeah. let's just plug in the uh, yeah, scheme with it. What is scheme with it? What did you say about it being in the USSR? What did I say about evading? Hmm, I don't understand. I, 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 let me answer. That was meant for somebody else. Okay, good. <laughs> well, if they can hear it online, that's yeah, good. You're good. Uh, I guess maybe they can. I'm not sure. Okay. I'll try it again. Oh. Well, we can. I selected a few interesting video, you know, independent audio pieces. So, okay, and we'll keep rolling. There's just very few of those. Okay, oh, um, I need to that. yeah get rid of that other. Here we go. Okay, so again, you'll have access to this. There's a whole series of whistles, very very loud, that our, all our satellites record emanating from the Earth. Uh, Mark. Okay, wait a second. I'm in. I got to get you back here. It's on this screen, and I'm trying to get back to the uh, one back up here. There we go. I'm getting that screen. Oh, there it is. Now it's working. Okay. Okay. So the race is on. Now, what they wanted to do. Is they have they have enough interest? They have all these scientists prior to this big race to go to the moon. They have all these scientists been studying this. What is down there? What's causing these things that are affecting us worldwide? I mean, you you know the number of earthquakes and things that have happened that would affect us immediately, as opposed to traveling to the moon. So what are we going to do? How are we going to drill a hole? So now these people are all getting excited. 
a whole group of scientists start talking about how to do this. And I'll show you later in the screens, you'll see how they frame this up. We got to get there before the Russians. The Russians already sent a satellite up in space. We've got to beat them. We got to beat them to the moon. So they formed this group of scientists called the American Miscellaneous Society. What a strange name, right? Which was a group of odd scientists. They were only in existence for probably eight years or something like that. They kept they kept writing proposals, and the proposals were rejected. And finally, one of them got approved by the National Science Foundation. And then they suddenly found out as they're reading through the proposals that this is a conflict of interest. I have to leave the company or the university I'm working for. And anyways, it caused a whole rigmarole. So they finally got some funding. And they said, look, we can borrow a large drilling ship from the old companies. We've, we've taught, I've got some friends that will help along this. And by the way, it's coming in from uh, four oil companies. We've got this now. Yeah, oh, wait. oh, by the way, it's an old war surplus barge. <laughs> this is the US jumping into this, right? Got to beat the Russians out there. And we're going to try to drill through this thin layer where the crust is thin. You see, the crust is only maybe three to five miles thick here. But if you go to the continent, it's like 25 to 35 miles. So the geologist, and like I said, it's, it's much thinner. So all the ships at the time were drilling the oil ships. They didn't have Derrick's out in the ocean and everything else at the time. The oil ships that were out there that were trying to find oil for that purpose was, you know, they dropped down maybe 100 feet, maybe 200 feet. They didn't do anything deep water. So this is all new. These scientists are inventing ways of how to do this. How are we going to do this? So they come across the ship and they, they spent all these months outfitting it in San Diego and they put all these motors on the outside when we get it out in the ocean, we're going to run all these motors together and keep it still on the surface of the ocean. Oh, by the way, there's no GPS, <laughs> nothing else to try to do this, right? So the fortunate thing, so here they put the motors on the outside. And then what they did is they lowered a series, a big circle of these large anchors, probably big pieces of concrete and sonar boys and some boys on top and the ship. He would look at that and using sonar, be able to keep the ship straight. That's how they were doing it. But this is a great part of the story. So how I got into this is John Steinbeck, famous novelist, right? He was also an amateur oceanographer. And he gets on the ship. He gets writing on the ship, which is great. And he's writing all these articles in Life Magazine. He's telling day by day, talking about, oh, we're in the ship. It's night. There's 14 foot seas. The wind's blowing at 35 knots. These guys are still working 24 day, hours a day. And of course, he describes the boat as a barge. Now, keep in mind, it gets out of San Diego and they had to have tugboats push it way out, 220 miles out in the ocean to get to this spot. And they start going down. When they start going down, they say, success. We only had a limited amount of money, but we did it. I mean, what did they do? How did they claim success? Okay, so here's pieces of the guys on the ship. They're doing their drilling and they called it Project Moho. And these guys are working 12 hour shifts, 24 hours a day, nonstop, running the pipe down. And you have to figure that out here. Okay, so each piece, as they're doing this, this is new technology. Each piece of pipe weighs 1,500 pounds. Calculate in your head, they went down 11,700 feet in water before they touched the bottom. So you add that up. I think it's about 22 pounds a foot. So 22,000, 22 pounds times 11,007. As Steinbeck said, if this pipe moved a few inches while they got their hand there, it's going to kill them. If they miss it off the derrick, it's going to rip the derrick off. So everything was new. So he's describing why they're doing this. He goes, oh, you don't understand. The wind is where I'm really glad nobody got hurt. And, and he's talking about broken cables and other stuff which is great, you can get to these old magazines. So, but it was so exciting, President Kennedy was involved. He says, look, this is fantastic. All the scientific achievements, you're figuring out how to do this. If we can get to this, these areas, this is great engineering. Guess who's reading Life Magazine? I'm sure the Russians are. <laughs> we made everything public. Okay, so kind of in a summary. So here's John Steinbeck here. 
I just threw a couple. This is in 61. Remember, he talked about Easter, you know, uh, April 1st, and someone he's describing. He won the Pulitzer Prize in 1962 for Grapes of Wrath. He had a number of publications. Okay, and of course, sadly, just a few years later, he dies. But if you look over here, let me see if I, because you don't see this, I put a pointer. If, if you look up here, there's a faint image of the ship, of course, not the scale. And you got 11,700 feet of ocean. You can imagine keeping that pipe straight on this open ocean, moving up and down. They drilled down through, and the first 560 feet was pretty good. They soft clay. Then they got about 41 feet into rock crust, and they go, okay, success. <laughs> oh, by the way, they only got about four more miles to go at that spot before they ever got to this boundary even though that's the thinnest part of the earth where the boundary exists. So, okay, here's some samples of the core. And of course they were worth a fortune and all that money that they take to get them. Uh, they did discover when they did this digging, they did discover even when they were so many feet down, they were pulling up things that were 33 million, you know, million year old um, Miocene era fossils and other things living as they got down in there. Okay, so let's do a quick review. They get this used ship, they, re, they re outfit it. Uh, they try to get funding, they kept fighting for funding, and finally by 61, when they got everything done and they're out of the water, the scientists, which this group was there for a short time and broke up, they established this project Mohol to say, how can we have these seismic waves? Why is this occurring? And oh, by the way, if all these diamonds and everything, uh, rare elements are coming up, maybe we'll find a ton of stuff. And then finally, in March 61 is when they're out there in the water. They do this drilling and it became very expensive. And right after they did that, the ship went back in. Vice President Lyndon Johnson says, oh, you know, under the table, these are part of the readings. And under the table goes, oh yeah, we're gonna use Brown and Root to build this new ship to do all this work under the table. So of course it, did, it didn't go through the bidding process and their arguments and backfighting. And finally, it kept spiraling out of control. And by 19, they never, they never went back. By 1966, they disbanded the whole project. <laughs> Obviously, focusing going to the moon. Okay, so that's what I mentioned earlier. How far they got down. Okay, so this area, this boundary, is not the only one. There are others that obviously, in our lifetime, I don't think we'll ever touch. So here's the cross. Here's the Moho boundary. I'm trying to figure out you know, why that occurs. And there's some of the others just for information. All the way down, we've got them labeled, labeled. So that way, if somebody in the group or the audience wants to know more about what are these boundaries are all about, that's how they separate the different sections of the earth. OK, so Soviets are not going to be outdone. So they start their project. They announced it in May, but they started much before then. They were reading and following this. They decided to get this spot. Here's Norway. Here's Finland, right at the very corner up in the, this is the Arctic Ocean. I've got the dirt. See, and, the, and right here, they got to hit this spot. They went down and they found out that some of the stones in the surface, because they're looking for riches too, the stones on the surface are over 3 billion years old, some of the rocks. So they said, well, if we go way up here, I think we're going to really get into something. They don't be outdone. The Russians are going to do this. So they build this enormously super deep hole. Anybody heard about this hole? Okay. So the project was going to drill as deep as possible into the crust. How do we do this? We definitely have to learn from the Americans because they had that rotating shaft, a regular drilling tip operation. So what they did is how do we drill a very deep hole through the crust? So they realized that they just couldn't put in the Russians doing this, they could not put in a rotating shaft. They're going to lower a pipe down and they're going to start doing drilling mud, which has got oil and lubricants and all kinds of things in it. And they have to build a special head to be able to go grind and cut that depth. They picked the site because of these, they figured that what's going to go, as they go deeper, it's going to be better. Okay. And why they announced in that day of May 1970 is because it's the anniversary of Lenin. Okay. They had already put up 16 laboratories. They're already hiring people. And they're telling, they're telling their scientists, we're gonna uncover enormous riches. 
diamonds, gold. I mean, that's where it comes from, the core. So they set up 16 research laboratories and they're telling everybody hands out, goes, look, we're gonna triple your salary. Oh, by the way, we're gonna give you a place to live. We're gonna have food supply. Come up, you know, come up and live up here. So plus an 18 month period, they had the International Geological Congress and that was in Moscow. They wanted the announcement to the world to say, we're out doing the Americans. We've got this big conference. It's Lenin's birth anniversary and we're gonna beat them. So, and they weren't gonna share the data, screw you. <laughs> okay, so they got down a ways, a third, a third of the way through the crust. Okay, but let's find out what actually happened. What, what discoveries came out of this? Okay, so they thought the calculation said when they get down about 10,000 feet, that the temperatures should be around boiling. Oh no. There were some, some reports showed close to 500. Temperatures are really hot. They, they thought that the whole reason this was occurring was because granite, which is a light color, much more refined, and basalt, which is also a volcanic, but it's black, dark basalt. And they said, it must be this change as it hits basalt, it's old layers of the earth, volcanic activity. But they found out not at all. They found out that the rock was fractured all through their drilling. It fractured and it was tremendous heat and pressure. And they thought so much water was coming out, tons of water. They think that water was actually being created from the hydrogen and oxygen under pressure. It was actually forming water. So they came through with abundance, numerous breakdowns, just constant water coming out of the earth and deep depths. They found some living, so being your microscopic uh, plankton, fo some fossils all the way down at four miles buried in the granite, way down. Then some of the soil samples, I thought this was really interesting. While we're going to the moon, I just remember we just landed, and they're doing the digging. They found out that 1.8 miles was an exact sample. It matched all the soil that came back from the surface of the moon and we dug into the moon. It was identical to 1.4, you know, 1.8 miles down. So that kind of makes you think about what was really there, right? What was the earth like then? Okay, large quantities of gases. And that's what they said. They were thinking some of the gases were forming water and so on. And instead of thinking that the rock under tremendous pressure and temperature is denser, is actually decreasing, becoming very porous. And the stone and the rock down there actually became like plastic. So you can, if you've ever tried to drill through plastic, a simple piece, as they're drilling through it, everything's just getting gummed up and trying to work it through, through the soft uh, materials, stone materials. And there was a sound you could play. I think you saw that Vimo, and you could hear all the rumbles from the earth. And there was another couple other things. You can, you, you can click on these or something if you have the presentation. So they're all excited. They're making announcements. They got buildings shut up. They had a stamp about this great thing to science and how we supported Lenin. And, and they had a target there at, on that date in 83. Remember it started in 90 or 1970. In 83, they got down 12,000 meters. They're trying to get down to 15,000, which they never made. But Okay. So they had a goal to get down to 15,000 meters. They reached a vertical depth of 40,000 or 7.6 miles. And it stands today as the deepest hole but not the longest. When I say not the longest, they have drilled holes and holes have kind of went along to find an oil field, but doesn't mean the deepest. You gotta admit, this is amazing for the time. So the drill in, ended in 1995 and you have to kind of guess, why did they suddenly stop? What caused them to stop? Well, Green dwarfs. Huh? Green dwarfs. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. There's a the drill head. Okay, so it became impossible because this plasticity of the rocks, right? They're still studying the samples today. By the way, you can't have any. I don't, we're not gonna share the data. <laughs> okay, well, 1995, if you remember the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union dissolved, right? And so think about that. They dissolved, lack of funds. Um, scientists in this room, uh, guys are doing great. 
I know I said I was, I know you're about three weeks behind in paycheck. Um, forget it. Find your own way home. <laughs> so there's no money. Okay. And out of this generated some amazing uh, legends. So this one, I'll bring up this whole piece here. Is that it? Yeah. So they stopped in 95. They got down to the depth. And all of a sudden, a series of things. And I'll give you the background. So in Finland, right on the border, there was some simple, you know, magazines, whatever, that would, re that would print anything. So if somebody could write, so somebody wrote a five, like a five or six page letter telling the story, and they published it. Well, somebody else published it. They got through about five publications through different people in the area, different groups and magazines. And finally, it was picked up by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and published in their magazine that, by the way, they drilled a hole to hell. They, they said that when they got down so far, the head was just moving around. It was empty, and they're getting screams and sound. Right, right. So if you read the hoax carefully, which I, I print all this stuff up to, if you read this carefully, they say they drove a hole in Siberia. Well, that's wrong. It went 8.9 miles, wrong depth. And the temperatures, they lowered a heat tolerant microphone. Well, actually that never occurred. And if you read the details, they said the, the, the fabrication here was the heat microphone was lowered at 2000 degrees. Well, wait a second. I don't know of a 2000 degree microphone you can lower, right? So this was fascinating. I dug into how they did this. So there was an audiologist that found some uh, expert on this. They said they took an old Italian movie, and I don't remember the name in Italian, and I played it to find the spot where they captured it. And they, when they sent it to the United States in 72, it was called Barren Blood. And they took this little audio clip, which is almost near the end of the movie. And you can see where they sliced it every 14 seconds, and they kept replaying, kept replaying the same piece. And you can hear all these screams that were fabricated for the movie. It's done. So I think if you play this, this is uh, Art Bell. They got it on the West Coast and a national broadcast, and he's talking about it and, and uh, so on. So this got replicated. And finally, in 92, 95, uh, it keeps getting updated. They said there was an aberration came out of it. And they said there was medics had to treat the people. As you go farther, this, this just keeps spiraling into a classic legend. So. Anyways, not all's lost. Okay, so back again. The, the crust is much thinner under these depths. Uh, there's the different layers in the boundary. And these are types of, of rocks. So this would be a, um, a basalt rock. They're talking about what's in different layers, but they, they don't know. They're only judging this from seismic activity. Okay, so. Like I said, now all is lost. So they learned from the American experiment. They, they never knew how to do this. From the American experiment, they said, you know what? We can actually go into deep ocean now and lower equipment and figure out what's here. And they're using this today. Today, they have all these uh, expeditions that are going out. And as they go down and capture so many feet into the ocean floor at these extreme depths, they look at it and they can see what's happened to climate change in short order, undisturbed. So they're using it for climate change now. You know, we may recover and there are all kinds of reports you're reading about what they're doing. Uh, what wrong button? <laughs> I pushed the, okay. I pushed this button, the minus sign. Do I go back and I pushed this up by accident. Do you recall the story of the bacteria that you found, that the Russians found at the bottom of the hole? Um, they brought it up and it was a microbe that ate rocks. Yeah. But it turns out that in the DNA of that microbe was the ability to process oxygen. Hmm. So even though it was two miles deep, it had the DNA in it for breathing. Yeah, all I did was touch that minus. Yeah, yeah. yeah the um, and they have come up. I mean, why is this important? Because when the um, robots are on the surface of Mars. And they're looking for life. What they're talking no, about is three to four miles. They're digging into this, and they're finding life living. They're finding living organisms actually in the granite, burrowing through, and they excrete granite. And they're living off oxygen, other stuff that's in there, which is amazing. 
we have life all through our planet. And we don't really know what life is farther down. And you remember they did, they discovered it wasn't what five, 10 years ago when they found the thermopods? Yes. With their, I've actually got some new stuff on right. the inner core in my slideshow that I put together now for, uh, for April. Right. Right. So to, to let everybody else know what this is talking about is down in the down in the ocean from these jets coming through these hot jets, some are in excess of 250, you know, some of the organisms that live and move around those jets don't even reproduce until it's overboiling. The water has to be extreme pressure over 200 and some degrees before they can even reproduce. So, you know, what do you do for that? And they never knew about that life, what, five years ago? So, yeah, 10 years ago now, we thought that was discovered. No. Okay, so go ahead, keep going here. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay, Kristen. Yep. Okay, so what's happening today? Well, like I said, the American experiments are not lost. We've got all that information. We hopefully we'll get some more from the Russians. There is a company out, it's a spinoff. Uh, they're talking about it recently, MIT, and it's called Clay's Energy. Okay. And Quay's Energy, what they do is they're lowering a pipe down and using millimeter, you know, they're blasting the rock with light. And what they're trying to do is go down 12 miles and as they'll form a, a eternal supply of energy from the hole. So they're planning on putting a number of these out. And of course, like I told you about climate change and so on. Okay, so some of the credits, uh, anyways, if you're really interested in looking like for old National Geographic and Life magazines of this stuff, this is a great site. Books at Google. Yeah. I'll come to our house. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So. 1888 is the oldest we've got. Wow. Yeah, they're first ones. We have original. Anyways, um, so there's a number of sites I was able to pull information from. Okay. Uh, there are some other videos I had. Um, this site, they cross over from Norway and they call it Wolf, Mount, Wolf Lake in the mountains and they give little tours. I'm scurrying through here. There was another hole that was uh, beating the Russians, but then it got, you know, taken over. Okay, just information. So some photographs. Here's a building. Here's what it looks like today, all destroyed. People visited the spot. They got it welded shut. Obviously, they don't want any aberrations to come out, you know, <laughs> any little green people out there. Um, and here's some other photographs out of Life magazine. I was reading this. This 30,000 pound tube, it, it cost him $8,000 to buy the diamond drill head. And you could read in there where the guy lowered it and screwed up something and he lost the cable, he broke it, and he had to stick down a fishing hook. Or, and they were talking about heavy rigging and stuff. So they had to they do the drilling and then they go lower a core. And they grab the core material and pull it out, and then they go back to start drilling again. It's interesting how they how they did their pieces, and that's another de description on the end showing the buoys. Okay, that's it. So, um, any questions? Of course, we don't hear audio, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you're digging holes that deep and they hit the bottom, what's to stop that from erupting and pushing right back up through the hole? Um, Dave Thompson is asking if they dig a hole and hit lava, what does it prevent the lava from coming back up the hole? So, so yeah, so the Russian hole was what, uh, nine, you know, maybe nine inches at best. And of course, their core samples were pretty small, two inches or whatever. Um, the one deep in the ocean, I guess if lava started coming out of that, it would have a lot of a lot of miles to travel, several miles to travel through the ocean before we'd see it. It's, it's possible. That was, by the way, the second Russian hole. The first one got down in the head room. Yes. And they pulled out what they could and then started building on the same wall. Yeah, I think there were five total. Five total? Yeah, I think there were five total. This is the one that they advertised. But again, I say up front, I'm, I'm not a research geologist <laughs> or a specialty in the field, but this was a really fascinating study that tied into this race. Um, so I guess we we out of it, a lot of the science came from us oceanography and climate change and everything else. And the Russians kind of held it back. They were thinking they were going to get rich with all these minerals and new, new elements and everything. Okay, any other question? Thanks, yes. We watched that 
How Italy's moving? Does the boom? have anything to do with what you were talking about? It does with the close. So so Cindy, and Cindy asks if uh, Cindy yes. Easterly is watching a documentary about Italy moving physically the whole the, the whole peninsula. The boots move, moving, moving to the east. And why don't this have anything to do with the, what we've learned from this borehole thing? What, it's, what it's, channel was that? Probably plate tectonics. Yeah, it was uh, mystery, mystery of uh, Italian mountains or something like that. It was, something, but I, it was a documentary. Was on the but, so, so let me throw a thought to you. Let me throw a thought. Um, consider the Russians set up Sputnik and got everybody to change from military to establish NASA. What if the Russians hadn't done that? What if we would have went into Russia and helped them rebuild and help their cities and so on, right? And Maybe, if you have to think back to this, maybe there would have been no race. No race to go to the moon. You have to kind of think about this as pluses and minuses, that the competition, threats and competition, actually cause us to invent ways, just like the World War II and all the things we Necessity developed. Necessity is the mother of redemption. Right. Yeah. right. And they may have never got the funding to drill this hole. Um, it was still been a mystery. So. In HQL's The Shape of Things to Come, the first rocket to go to the moon was launched in 2035. 2035. Mm -hmm. H.G. Wells, what was the, what was the name of it? The, sh the Shape of Things to Come. Shape of Things to Come. The first rocket launched was in 2035. Yeah. So we're, we're getting close. <laughs> did, did I say it earlier? You know the Russians had a moon rocket. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and in fact, that was one of the really cool things that happened after the war is and they had this a long, long time ago on my slideshow where uh, the Russians actually showed the U.S. astronauts the lunar landing. So they, they how, did get to the other side of the yeah, first. How yes. we knew about some of this activity real quick was that the spy satellite, one of the satellites, the Gambit system that they're showing at the museum, one of the photographs showed the, the rocket being assembled, this massive rocket on the sand being assembled. And then one of the photographs showed this massive explosion clearing out an area a quarter mile where I don't know how many people got killed. You never hear about it in the news, anybody dying, <laughs> and, and you never hear about the discussion about their moon launch. Or how many astronauts they lost in the process. In the loss yeah, of the process. Well, it's all real quiet. It's just all success. A story came out okay. later on about um, I'm done. One, of the, one of the moon rockets that they used was actually one of the Soyuz rockets. And what they did to make the lunar lander, to make them something deep in the lunar lander, was they put five of them together. And when the thing launched, it peeled like a giant banana. <laughs> and Lost Doc banana. was sitting in the stands about two and a half miles away. Yeah. And one of the boosters flew right over top of them and landed half a mile behind them. <laughs> it's a little frightening. Yeah. That Any, was it, the last time the public viewer ever went to a rocket. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody, <laughs> want, anybody want popcorn? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Bob. Thank you very much. And that is being Okay, that's just like clicking it. Yeah. Or you can, I think you can just, as long as the mouse stays over here, you can click it. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. All right. And without Thanks. further ado, Marty Pepe. Thank you. Thank you, folks. I hope everybody's doing okay tonight. Um, look at the formal title of this talk Astronomy's Dark Ages. You might be tempted to think of. Um, oh, left way. Just hit the left way. Just hit this left way. Nope. All right. Okay. You hit the right click. Oh, oh, oh okay. Just left oh, okay. Yeah. So you might be tempted with that type of title to think of something like this, and that is the old geocentric model of the Earth 
were, were geocentric model of the universe, where everyone was certain that the Earth was the center of everything. That's not what we're going to talk about today. Good. You might be tempted to think about something like this, medieval times, when there was all darkness and witches and all that stuff. But remember, God still loves you, and but we're not going to talk about that either. Okay, what are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to talk about cosmic chemistry. And I'm going to prove to you that you are made of star stuff. Now, you remember this guy? This is the expansion of the universe, starting with inflation, going out to present day, when we've got Earth, Sun, Moon, and planets, and all the other stuff, right? So I want to call your attention to something. What we're going to talk about is this time period in here. Now, take a good, careful look at the time span. You know, we're talking almost 14 billion years here. All right, and you know the present day is our galaxies that we're used to with Hubble, right? And you know, at the other end of the scale, if we look back in time, we know that the early expansion of the universe was the cosmic background radiation, right? So take a look at this time span. This is the beginning of everything. That's 14 billion years looking back in, right? Look at this, a million years out of 14 billion. That's a wink in the eye. If you think that's short, how about 10 minutes out of 14 billion years? Right? Oh, sorry. No, boy. Yeah, with my size, that's not hard. <laughs> um, so anyway, so this is the kind of stuff we're going to talk about. Now, you know, for example, the stuff that you see, if I can get the cursor over here. There we go. Okay, so you've got things like this, right? Horsehead Nebula. Whirlpool. You know that from this avenue of things that you see all these pretty colors. Well, what they really are is hot stars are illuminating these gases. And it's this spectral color that we actually see. So you know from spectroscopy, and I think Leo is probably one of the best ones in our group for this, hydrogen and helium. Notice when the electrons in the orbit drop from orbit three down to the base orbit, orange. Four to two, light blue. Five to two, dark blue. Six to two, purple. Here's helium. Notice none of these are the same. This essentially is the fingerprint of what that star is made of. Okay? So, come on, where's the cursor? He's son of a gun. There we go. So, let's go back to this guy again this 1 million years or 10 minutes. What is that? Well, let's review just quickly, right? We've got Hubble Deep Field here, present day. We've got Kobe, the microwave background here. Then we kind of slide a little bit into Spitzer with first light. And notice this called dark ages. And all the academics wave their hands real nice and they tell you that it's very little is known about it. Well, that's BS because a lot is known about it. But what it's is there's an extremely small group of people working on it. So let me show you that. And so that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. So just to reiterate the expansion of the universe, the beginning, present day, and this little slice in the middle here, all right? And that's what the HSK is. And, and now I, I'm, I'm elated that you showed the Kelvin and Hobbes stuff because here is the kind of stuff we're talking about, all right? So 
We have the Colby at the beginning. We have Spitzer. We have Hummel. This is from the time when everything was just energy, pure energy. And how did we make this jump from energy to matter? What created that? What caused that? So look at this guy, energy to matter. It's essentially with hydrogen and helium. I kind of call it second gear when I'm talking about it to some of my class, all right? So what do we know about this? And how does this work? And why does it create this infamous HSK event? You're going to get a chuckle out of this one. The HSK event is the horrendous space kablooey. <laughs> and it's right out of a Calvin and Hobbes a comic. And they considered that the Big Bang was just too boring a phrase. So they came up with this horrendous space kablooey. Oh my God, I can't even say it. And that, believe it or not, is what this little group is using to describe that dark ages event, dark sky event. So let's talk about this a little bit. You know that that's atomic hydrogen, right? That's a good view of atomic hydrogen. And that's the atom for hydrogen. It's got proton as a core, an electron, and those orbits that I was showing you before depends on how much energy that atom is storing up. Baseline orbit two, way out here, lots of energy to give up. Okay. That's, our, that's our galaxy above it. Yes, yes, yes. And that's just the hydrogen associated with that. Yes, thank you. So you remember this from high school physics or chemistry class? This is the periodic table. There is an interesting derivation of that periodic table. And that is where these elements have come from. Dying low mass stars, exploding massive stars, merging neutron stars, cosmic ray fission, the Big Bang fusion. That's the roadmap for where that stuff comes from. And if you doubt that, I'm going to show you how that happens. But first, we're going to talk about this guy, hydrogen. And that guy, helium, the two simplest elements that we know of. Okay, so the abundance of elements in the universe. That is a map of the mo pretty much most of the stars that are made of. Hydrogen, helium, carbon, <clears throat> nitrogen, oxygen, and iron. Look carefully at this vertical scale. What is it? It's a logarithmic scale. People don't do well with logarithmic scales. Your vision is logarithmic. That's why you can see on a bright sunny day and you can see in deep dark in the bedroom when it's dark at night. Here's what it looks like on a linear scale, which mentally most people can process. Hydrogen, helium, and everything else is down in the noise. This is the astronomer's periodic table. Everything's hydrogen, a little bit of helium, and all this other crap is in the margins. Excuse my French. So how do we know that? How do we know that? Well, early stars, the population two stars, formed outside of the band of the Milky Way where none of those healthy, heavy elements were yet formed. All of those stars are light elements. The stars in the body of the Milky Way where their older, more complex elements, their components are the more complex construction. So the older stars formed way out here, there were no heavy elements to form from. They were metal, they're called metal poor stars. Okay. So, an atom structure, you saw what hydrogen was like before. So, this is helium. Notice the difference two protons instead of that one, two electrons in the outer orbit instead of just that one. Something new. 
two neutrons in the core. Okay, remember we said that's the second most uh, plentiful element in outer space. So we have these two, they call them noble gases. There's your hydrogen, there's your helium. Notice how close they are, except this is doubled up essentially of that guy. Think of the expanding universe as cooling down. As it's expanding, it's cooling down, right? So hydrogen gas cloud keeps getting denser and denser just from the sheer Coriolis effect, right? This is a few light years across. And as this spins, it pulls in on itself from just mass. There's a basic problem with this though. Well, think about it. It's like squeezing a water balloon. You squeeze it and squeeze it and squeeze it and it pops out somewhere else. So there's a reverse pressure pushing back out on what you're trying to collapse in, okay? Now, let's take our nice little simple hydrogen. And now we've got this nice helium. I mean, how do we get from there to there? How? Let's take a look. You have isotopes of hydrogen. Deuterium, for example, is a hydrogen molecule with what? A neutron in it. Yeah, I don't see one up there, but we can make this synthetically. And that's what deuterium is. It's got a proton like it's supposed to have, and now it's got a neutron. If the hydrogen has no electron, just a core proton, it's called protium. This guy is called deuterium. You can also have one where there's two in the core. That's called tritium. Any of you know about early atomic physics, these two things, deuterium and tritium, ought to stand out like a flag. You take deuterium and tritium, you press them together under incredible pressures and incredible temperatures, and what happens? You get a neutron, a helium atom, and a boatload of energy. What is that? You guys know this process. You really do know this process. And that is called what? Fusion. That is essentially nuclear fusion. Okay? So we've got this hydrogen and this helium that we're messing with. So how do we go beyond that? I just showed you how you make helium from hydrogen. How do you go beyond that? Well, we've got a new little thing called this little molecule. It's helium and hydrogen with an extra electron. Now, if there anybody, if there's any chemist in the, in the crowd, you ought to recognize that guy. Let me show you what it is. It's a hydride. Come on. What's going on? I see it there, but I don't see it there for some reason. Okay, Mark, where are we broken? Here? I see it in the preview, but I don't see it. Oh, maybe put the there you go. Okay, there we go. Thank you. So a hydride, this is a hydride, is a binary compound formed by hydrogen and some other element, usually something that's more uh, reactive, if you would, like sodium hydride or methyl hydride, those NaH, CH4, for example, those are hydrides, all right? So, make sure I don't, okay. To the right. To the right. There you go. No. 
right there. Right there. Okay. So what is this mystery molecule that we're talking about? Well, let me try to tantalize you with something. This is the pH scale for elements. Some of you may not be familiar with that. Water, pure water is a pH of seven on a scale from zero to 14. There's pure water, all right? Tomato juice, for example, is a four. Vinegar that you might use in cooking or around to clean the house, that's a two. Battery acid, that's a zero. Going the other way, what? Toothpaste is a nine. Household ammonia is an 11. And things like bleach, and that is 13 and 14. This is a common pH scale that, unless you're a chemist, you might not uh, appreciate that. So here is the same scale, but flipped over. That's all I did was flip it top to bottom. And let's talk about this guy. This mystery element that we're talking about is an extremely strong acid. It's off the chart on this pH scale when it comes to acidity. And it's very, very reactive. The best way to characterize this guy would be what? A super acid. Way beyond what you would ever think about aqua regia or hydrochloric acid. This goes orders of magnitude greater than that. So this, what's this mystery molecule? Well, let me tease you with this. This is a periodic table of hydrides. And you'll notice some things on here that are familiar. Beryllium, lithium, salt, magnesium, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So think a little bit about your high school or college chemistry. This guy is called helium hydride. This mystery molecule is called helium hydride. And that was the day one of chemistry 101 in the universe. And it's frequently called the Dawn molecule. Because from this little guy is where everything else that you know of today was born. Everything. And let me show you how that is. That's when the pot really started to boil, when things really started to cook. Take a look at this chart. It's rather intimidating if you're not a chemist, which I'm not. Diatomic two, triatomic three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 13, all right? More complex molecules going to the right. All of these things, all of them without exception, are found in outer space. And there's even more than this. This was a very early list. So let's see if we can't unravel this onion and make it a little less intimidating. Take a look at this, all right? H2, molecular hydrogen, this guy. First one on the list. Most hydrogen that's on Earth is molecular hydrogen. This guy, benzene. If you ever went to the dry cleaner, you were exposed to benzene. Carbon monoxide, you certainly know what that is. That's that guy. HCl, hydrochloric acid. And SiO2, Silicon dioxide is an element in quartz. How about the next one? Okay, H2O, you certainly know what that is. Water, right? And CO2, carbon dioxide. Again, these are all made from that one little molecule. And oh, by the way, there's the water. That's the atomic structure of water. These two atoms share electrons. That's a chemical makeup of it, if you're a chemist at all. And that is an electron micrograph of an actual water molecule. I don't know if you can read that scale. That's one nanometer. Let's 
Let's try to make it a little bit more complicated. That guy is ethanol. Gee, where have you seen that lately when you went to put car? Not, yeah, he's, he's tipping his hand up. Why I could use one of those. Uh, or when you're putting gas in the car. How about this one? CH4, that's methane. How many of you use it to cook your, your dinner and heat your house? And then finally, take a look at this guy, eight atoms, methylformic. Any biological chemist in the crowd? Formic acid. That makes up a component of your RNA and DNA. Every living cell that we know of on this planet has got formic acid in it. Every single one. There, again, is a reminder is the origin of the solar system elements based on which stars they came from. As a reminder. So let's talk about the process. What's the burning sequence of stars? Starting out with hydrogen, right? That's element number one. And when that's consumed, we start burning helium. When that's consumed, we start burning carbon and then neon and then I can't see that from here sorry oxygen it should be yeah that's oxygen and then what's that guy silicon and then finally iron iron is the most dense element that you can make in the burning sequence of a star that's the densest one So let's take a look at this guy. Obviously, that's a shot of, of uh, M78, but the molecule known as helium hydride is believed to have started this. That helped, it was the press stone, if you would, the coolant for the stars. And as these things cooled, this started making the formations that we see now. Now, there's a basic problem here. What is the problem? Well, let's take a look. Oh, come on. So where do you look for this guy? Here is an interesting little tidbit. There are no helium hydride molecules presently found where the existing computer models say they should be. None of them. Why is that? Are the present computer models just wrong? Or has it all been used up? Remember I said it was an extremely reactive element? It's like trying to put out a alcohol pad on the table and come back a few minutes later and wonder why it's all evaporated and dry. It's a very reactive component. Or is there another possibility? Oh, I'm sorry. How do I go back? Right, right click. Page up. Okay. Or is the present detection threshold, our ability to detect it here on Earth, just too not sensitive enough? In other words, the detection threshold needs to go way lower. Our ability to detect it is too high. We need to be a lot more sensitive, in other words. Okay. Now, what would make you think that? Well, helium hydride detection in itself. All the original, even if we assume that all the original helium hydride has been used up because it's just too reactive, could there be new helium hydride being formed, generated right now? New models of existing dying stars say there might be. Does this picture ring a bell with anyone? What is that? Sophia. Sophia, right? And one of our own, if you recall, flew on this fine observatory. Anybody remember Valerie Rapson? She's over in the Albany area now. 
she didn't fly on this mission, but she has flown on Sophia. Well, the data, God, data? You really are going to use data? How dare you? Yes. In dying sunlight stars, they've actually detected helium hydride and NGC 7027. There is the detection and there is the threshold. And that's because on this guy, you get above 90% of all the water vapor on Earth and about 60% of all the oxygen. So you're out of the mess, the, 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 the surface mess of Earth. So this says, yeah, maybe this is indeed what's going on. Dave, is this one on your list at all? Do you recall? That is uh, up in, that's up in Cygnus, this orbit. So, anybody know what this is? That is a transporter carrying a radio telescope at Alma, 15,000 feet altitude. Their working level is down at 10,000 feet because that's the highest you can go and not have to wear a spacesuit. When these guys go up, I don't know if you can see the two operators here, when they go out to deliver one of these antennas to the 15,000 feet level, they've got to wear a low pressure spacesuit and breathe oxygen. That's the only way you can do this work. Can I interrupt you for a second, Marty? Sure. I, I observe NGC 7027 okay. in the summertime because it's very visible. It's a planetary nebula in Cygnus. Yep. And while you're talking about it, I look it up. It's a young, um, it's only 600 years old. So that explains why you have the uh, H3 there. Yeah. Yep. Remember, we're talking about an element that's extremely reactive. Its time span, its, its half-life is extremely short. It's not that it's not there, it's just that it goes away very quickly. So anyway, as we were talking here about, there we are. It's hoped that the helium hydride signal is presently too low to detect here, but that with the James Webb Space Telescope and ALMA, that we can push those thresholds back and begin to look at this. And there is an example, I'm sure uh, you guys have seen this in the news recently, James Webb Space Telescope with its orbit at L2. You may not have seen this. This is ALMA at 15,000 feet. And an interesting little tidbit, Dave, Dave always likes these little tidbits. Notice the cars that are here. Most all of those are cars with fuel injection. The best ones are have a turbo so they can take the thin air and compress it. And I was told if you're driving a car with a carburetor, don't turn it off because you might not get it restarted. Where is that located? Chile. It is Chile. Yeah, it's at, at Atacama. Uh, uh, it's in the Atacama Desert uh, at like 15,000 feet. It's on my bucket list. I don't know if I'll ever get there. But, uh, but yeah, it's in Chile. Matter of fact, when I was in a Green Bank, uh, West Virginia, uh, for my radio telescope classes, they were working on this hardware. And they were all excited that they actually had an engineer visit instead of just an astronomer. And they were taking me through the labs and everything else. The, the, the director, he didn't go home one night that week. He ate dinner with us the entire time. He was having a ball. Because mostly it's astronomers. They don't, they don't get a chance to get engineers to say, hey, how did you design this hardware? How did you do that piece of hardware, et cetera, et cetera. So it was kind of a, a cool thing for him. OK. And then finally, here is the coup de grace. This is your solar system elements. This is your makeup. Notice 73% exploding massive stars. Under 17% for low dying low mass stars. 9.5% for the Big Bang fusion, just a little bit of stuff. And then 1% for exploding white dwarfs. So this is your chemical makeup. I hope that I've convinced you 
that all of these items, all of these atoms are what's in your body. You are literally made of stardust. Okay. Come on. Where's the cursor? Where'd it go? Some yeah, that's what I thought it did. <coughs> there we go. Ah, and given Mark's perfect, perfect intro earlier tonight, I just couldn't resist putting this guy in here. Sometimes I think the sure signs that intelligent life exists elsewhere in the universe is that none of it has ever tried to contact us. And certainly with the last couple of months of things at Ukraine and everything else, I won't even tell you about how frustrating that is, okay? Oh, come on, we gotta do this again? No. Yeah, that's where I thought it was. Ah, now I can't resist doing this without Giving this a plug. Look at the average age of our astronomy clubs. Look at the average age of science. The age goes up and up and up. Right? Just look around here. Do the world a favor. Find a young mind that's interested. Mentor them. Most of you know that I mentor engineering students here on campus still. <laughs> Engineering mentoring. Just because you can make a pretty diagram of it doesn't mean it's going to work or doesn't mean you can build it. That's about 40% of the entire problem. You've got to make the parts or buy the parts, put it together properly, debug it, and test it, and actually take data before you know it's working, before you know your theory is verified. Do the world a favor and find a youngster that you can mentor. They are young minds, they are open, they suck this up, stuff up like a sponge. I'm amazed at my grandchildren and how much they're able to do at early ages. My youngest grandson is writing his own code. Barb, how, long, how old is, that? is Adam? Eight. Eight years old, and he's writing his own code. It's incredible when they're given half a chance what they can do. <laughs> And that's pretty much it, folks. Any questions, please? Thanks, questions at all? So it, James Webb isn't gonna be able to see that stuff, but is it that uh, looking for traces of- uh, I, think they're, I think they're looking for traces, yeah. yeah. And the trick is because it, it is so reactive that it doesn't linger for very long. Right. So it's got a really, really short half-life. So is it possible for us to see, uh, I, and I don't know what the uh, fingerprint of, of helium hydride looks like. Does it, it must have a spectrum. Well, we ought to send a note to Leo. Yeah. <laughs> so, so but yeah, it, it, it does have a spectrum. And I'm sure Mike would be able to rattle it right off if he yeah. was here. Yeah. So I think just in the last couple of days, Dave, uh, Dave so far, is James Webb just, we've got some official pictures. They've got the mirrors all aligned. Yeah, they got it all aligned. All the segments are aligned to one spot. Yeah, which is a fantastic photograph. I mean, I don't know if you've seen that. Of stars, I how far back. Yeah. Well, they're not going to be able to verify the stars yet, but the alignment is going fantastically. I mean, way better, way quicker than they had thought. Okay. Any hey, questions online? Anybody uh, watching have questions? <coughs> Jeff Carson, thank you for your talk. Thank you, great talk. Welcome. I just found it interesting. I, I kind of interrupted you when I was talking when you were talking about it, but I, I'm a, if you know me and when I, my observing, I am a planetary nebula nut. I love looking at planetary nebulas, mostly because they're colorful. You can actually see color. And when you look at, st at stars and stuff in the sky, you generally don't see a lot of color unless you're looking at some nebula. But planetary nebulas are colorful because you see ionizing oxygen and it's blue. <clears throat> when you 
look at a planetary nebula, often you'll see blue or blue green when you look at them. And this one, this NGC 7027, he pulled it up like, oh, I look at that all the time, every time I have an opportunity. It's up in, in the Cygnus, opposite where the blinking planetary is if you're a sky watcher. It's, a, it's, below, it's below the wings near the tail. One side has the blinking planetary. The other side is NGC 7027. And you forced me to look it up. And I found that it was only 600 years old, which means it's very young. It's a baby. It's like, I, I don't know of anything. It's in it's diapers. Young in Maybe not even diapers yet. That could be the youngest thing I know yeah. in the sky yeah. that's that far away. Now let, me, now, let me add a little tidbit to this discussion about talking about spectra. You know my passion lately has been radio astronomy. Some of you know. Um, think about the fact that all of that data, all of that color that you see is part of the same electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum that you see in the radio, all the way from the x-rays when you break your leg and you have to go into the hospital, all the way down to the AM radio. That's all part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Your eyes are a tiny, tiny little bit of that spectrum. So in reality, whether you realize it or not, God gave you tiny radio receivers. Yeah. How about putting that slant on, on the way you look at it? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> Amen. Okay, thank you. I am listening to this and I'm processing. And mind you, Big Bang Theory is my most favorite show. But it sounds like this still is creation. Yeah. yeah. It's still going on. To me, that actually Sure. Oh, boy, don't go there. Oh, That's a glitch. Don't, don't go there. I had that happen to a star online. The star show one night. Julie says, this validates creation. Bob says 6,000 years ago. Bob's thing was going to moles or whatever, right? And then yours, it really tied it together. And I'm thinking, aha. I don't believe that things just exploded and not evolved of that, but I do believe that required a man to something. I'm not going to touch that subject, but maybe our idea of what God is is not quite the best because it was made by who? It was, it was an image made by man. True. So you tend to think only as far as what your brain. imagination or brain can think of. I mean, how many times has it become a mysterious event? And then what would the ancients have thought of an airplane or a rocket today? Mm -hmm. Right. And that's why I threw that little slide in there about medieval times, because that's exactly what they would have thought of half this stuff. Yeah. So maybe it's our shortcomings when it comes to his work that we aren't really appreciating. Right. And I'll Amen. stop right there because otherwise I'm going to get yeah. into <laughs> religious trouble. We'll, 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 we'll stick, stay away from the theology. I'm sorry? Who said there's glory in heaven and earth and there's dreamed of in your science? Glory in heaven and earth and there's dreamed of in science. Who said that? I don't know. I don't know. Well, I don't know. We're going to. Well, I can tell you one thing. Uh, Jesus said there's glory in heaven and earth and there's dreamed of in your science. Well, yeah, there you Thank you. <laughs> when I taught at Roberts <laughs> Wesleyan, the head of the theology department would always ask me to come into his classes because, you know, every time someone presents something, you would challenge them to say, are you sure? Are you really sure? Do you have data that you can show me? And that really stresses a lot of people out because you tend to take it as gospel. And that right there is a pun in itself, but I, I won't get into that. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks, Marty. Thanks again. Well, Both Bob and Marty, well. thank you so much, guys. Great talk. We had about uh, 15 people online and probably another 11, 12 here, so about uh, 26 people. So thanks, everybody, for coming. That was fun. Enjoyed it. And for those of you online, I'm going to end the meeting unless you have further questions. Comments? I had no idea that you hearing anything? Nope. Well, thanks everybody. Have a good night. And uh, we'll see you in April for our April meeting. Have a good night, all. Yeah. Have a good night.